Hello, everyone. Welcome to BOV1127, What's Next for SUSE SDI Customers. I'm Mark Darnell, a Senior Product Manager for SUSE. I'm presenting out of my home office in Boulder, Colorado. With me is Yaroslav Kornilov, Product Manager for SUSE. He's working out of a home office in Nuremberg, Germany right now, regularly working out of our headquarters in Nuremberg. Thank you for joining us today. We will be taking four points to discuss SUSE NextGen SDI. These points are, first of all, we want to lay out SUSE's direction, where we've been, where we are today, and where we're going, and how this affects our NextGen SDI and our customers of that product. Second, we will be talking about SDI compute market segments because these are pretty critical. There's multiple segments, and we will be addressing those somewhat differently depending upon the segment. That's the third point we'll be discussing, how we're targeting those segments. Finally, we'll be drilling into next-gen SDI to make sure you understand exactly what features and capabilities will be available and how we're helping our customers transition to the future. In any discussion of direction, it's critical to ensure that you have both your starting point and your destination point in mind. From a mathematical perspective, you'll have a starting point, an end point, and a vector. That vector is your direction. So let's drive a stake in the ground. In October of 2019, Michael Miller, the President of Corporate Development and Strategic Alliances for SUSE, released the following press announcement, that SUSE would be exiting sell new sales of the OpenStack product into that market and would continue supporting our existing customers through their subscription lifetime. There are four, this is an excellent statement by the way, but there are four salient points that we want to pull out of this that will really help establish, once again, where SUSE has been, where we are today, and where we're going in terms of the SDI market. Those four sections or those four points are, first, focusing on the application delivery market, second, aligning with technology trends, third, aligning with customer needs, and finally, emphasizing the point that SUSE is a forward-looking, independent, open-source company that is growing and innovating. One quick note that I want to emphasize, since that press release came out, SUSE has since renamed or termed that market as container and application platforms. So from this point forward in the presentation, you will see container and application platforms rather than application delivery. I had to fit that in for to be compliant with our, our, our marketing branding department, uh, so just we have that out of the way. I'm now going to transition this to Yaroslav, who is going to go through these particular directions and once again emphasize where SUSE has been, where we are, where we're going in terms of the SDI marketplace. Yaroslav, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. In order to talk about container and application platform portfolio, we need to look back. At some point of time in the past, uh, SUSE made a decision to based um, solution, future solution on Kubernetes. And th that decision has an impact on containing an application uh, portfolio. First of all, we it, this portfolio consists of two products. First one is SUSE Cloud Application Platform, known as CAP. And this, this is a SUSE Cloud Factory offering. What makes it different from, from many others that it uses Kubernetes as a container orchestration engine. And as a result, it gives you a full service platform as a service offering. The second is a SUSE CAS container as a service platform, which we call, which we often call CASP, and that's a great, one of the best in of its on in class Kubernetes offering. The takeaway from this slide should be that Kubernetes is the foundation of SUSE application delivery portfolio. Next slide, please. Let's talk about technology, how SUSE is aligning with, with technology trends. And here, before we, we go for some of these bullet points, I would like to quote uh, one of the best of hockey, hockey player of all time, Wayne Gretzky. He once said, don't skate in to where the puck is, skate to where the puck is going to be. So this SUSE made, made an assumption, and let's, let's a prediction, let's see, um, how it's how relevant these assumptions with the current technology trends. First line, first bullet, 92 <clears throat> points of businesses as of today use virtualization, only less than 20% using containers. That sounds as not that great for the container-based solution, but 
if you look at into the second bullet, we can see that more than 70% of businesses will will be using containers by 2023. The <clears throat> landscape is changing. The third bullet is that according to the to the latest OpenStack custom review, more than 70% of all OpenStack customers, commercial and and, not, and free are concerned about moving into the new world where container service is running on top of OpenStack. Then I will skip the fourth and the, the I'd like to talk about the Kubernetes adaptation. At the moment it's as you can see it's up to the 86 percent. That was not the case in the past. In the past we have seen multiple competing solutions but today it's already clear that Kubernetes won this market and will will eliminate all others from, from it very quickly. Also it's important to remember that Kubernetes is a lingua franca and it's used for all kind of deployment on-prem, cloud, public and private. And also it's uh, the takeaway from this is that you will probably need more than one cluster, not too many, and you will probably fall into the, to the range between two and five. Thanks, Mark. Please, next. Thanks. So let's summarize the, all the technology tr trends alignment with several statements. First of all, Kubernetes is really the industry preferred solution for container-based SDI. Second, and if I would use the uh, another <coughs> hockey, hockey wording is that Kubernetes is entering the hockey stick growing rate. Next, IT shops as of today mostly based on virtualization solution, but it will change quickly as more and more container adaptation will happen. Next, IT shops will have multiple deployments in parallel in different clouds on-prem, etc. And the last but not least is that Converge solution that would offer containers and virtualization both as an equally good citizen of, of, of the product is becoming a must-have for any product that will be available in the market in the next years. Thank you, Mark. Next one, okay. aligning with the customer needs. In the current fast-moving agile economy, technology trends are very well adjusted with the customer needs. At the same time, and this Susicon is, is a really great example, the technology and customer needs are also very much connected. You don't need anyone else retelling you the stories. You can directly talk to us and they, you will be aligned with our thinking. So that's all together is forming a really great positive feedback look, feedback loop. And as a takeaway from this, we can take that same thing is, is equally right for the customer needs as was with technical. Kubernetes is really going to be the heart and the central point for any future SDI solutions. Thank you. Let's talk about uh, forward-looking independent open statement that we, we had in our, that Mark presented before. So indeed, we are the largest independent open source company and we are open in many senses. And it's not only giving back to the source code, but also sometimes it's more important to give you, to show you our thinking process, where we started, why we made the decision and where we are going. And forward-looking is, is also really important thing to can to remember because we really it, we are committed to not only to make some some predictions but executing them that's what makes us really a proud forward-looking company next slide please this is the chapter where we will talk about markets trends and most importantly segmentation but before we go into that, we have to re revisit what SDI is actually is. I don't have any more hockey analogy, that's just something else, but really powerful way to explain what it is. And SDI can be, you can think about SDI as a free legs tool 
where the first stack is a compute. It's, it's, it's an engine, runtime engine that will make sure that the application is running. It can be KVM, it can be a container runtime as Creo, it can be anything. The second is a storage. Even if you are in the cloud, you still need your data to be persistent. You need someone to handle your objects, your files, your data blocks persistency. And here we have a product called SUSIM Enterprise Storage that is fully aligned with Kubernetes and ready to take this challenge. And the third leg is, is that would connect all the dots, it's networking. And we are, we are using the power of Kubernetes a solution is specially combined with, with add-ons called Silum. So all together, that's good, but you need a um, seed, and this seed is Kubernetes orchestration engine, and all together that will create a nicely shaped Freelex tool. So let's move to the next. Here you have our view on the market. So we like to divide the market into the four, four pieces. First is IIS, and OpenStack is mentioned there because OpenStack is probably the, the only thing that survived so far on this, on this segment. The second, that's the old good virtualization where you have closed source, open source, and surprised you have also OpenStack, and we will talk about that later. You have container queries, that's the, 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 the market segment where you probably have similar to what you have in virtualization, but you're already testing the waters. You would like to see what is happening next. And the fourth one, the lucky one, it's the container focus where you're already living in a new world. Next slide. OpenStack IS. So what it is? What is the typical workload? The, it's usually something legacy, a VM form factor. It's probably monolithic. It's very probable that it's using client server architecture. And you can think about web farms and, as an example of, of, of an application that would, would run there. You can also see some disposable called cattle VMs there, but they are not very often. The key feature, so what makes you actually qualified to, to be part of this market is that, is that if you're using API to orchestrate all your workload, you create VMs, you create storage for that VM, you create networking for that VM, all using just an API. If you're doing that, then you are in the IIS type of the market. What about share? It's never, it was never really big and it's not actually growing. So it's something below 20% of overall SDA market. Next bullet here is that we observed a large migration of, of the developers who are moving from, from OpenStack to Kubernetes or satellite projects near the Kubernetes. Next slide, please. This is the the market that takes the lion's share, and the workload here is is to a certain extent the same as it was in the previous one, with two exceptions. You wouldn't find any cattles here, and you would find some business and mission critical things like telco application or network functioning virtualization. What makes you qualified for that is that if you have something that requires stability, that is something that is mission critical, it's something that business critical, and sometimes you can find OpenStack users here, and to dif to distinguish from the previous uh, segment, you can you can use the the the, the UI and horiz uh, called horizon panel. If you're using that to to manage your workload, then you're probably in this segment. So the market share is what we already discussed. It's at, at today 92% uh, of where everyone is using that. That is something that that uh, is 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 the biggest, but as we already discussed, 70% of OpenStack users thinking or doing already something to run containers on top of the OpenStack. That is a bridge for the next slide, please. Container queries. So you first of all, you keep running your legacy workload. That's something that pays your bill, and that's something that justify everything that you have. But for one or another reason, you might be 
willing to experiment with a new type of application which we call 12 factors for now for the purpose of this and the next slide you can you can re replace it with, with cloud native and mark will talk about that later so this is something that is a is, is a new type of the application which you your application render probably offering to you and you would like to know what does it mean to have that type of the application you're running it side by side with your old legacy VM this is the the big market as of today and it's going to be the biggest really soon as the customer transit to the state where they're running both type of the workload side by side mark please next And if you're lucky and you are starting your IT shop from the blank from the sheet, then you, you, you should be here. That's a type of the workload that is 12-factor uh, apps only. And you shouldn't, if you can, you must be here. So you skip the, the, the step where you first deploy the legacy form factor and then spend time and energy and money to migrate them into the new form factor. Do it here. So at this moment of time, I would like to stop and transfer to Mark. Thank you, Yaroslav. Appreciate the, the guidance on real, real quick recap. If you take a look at what Yaroslav described, he started off with decisions that Susan made pre even OpenStack days, where we started looking at containers, started moving into some existing products uh, that are existing products today. That's where we came from. Uh, we've made some decisions to align with market realities and where our customers are really trending to. Uh, let's go ahead and drill into that a little bit more. I want to give you a, a short discussion about here's what happens as you migrate, say, from a legacy application into, uh, into a cloud native or 12-factor application. Not going to spend a whole lot of time here because we don't have a huge amount of time to do it, but if you have questions on this, please feel free to reach out to us. Our email addresses are in the, in the title slide. So first of all, historically in telcos, you'll have appliances, these black boxes, which are self-contained. They'll usually have a motherboard in them with usually an Intel uh, compliant processor on it. A lot of times they'll run Linux, they'll have chips in them. This is what telcos have historically used. What's happened in the last few years is they've started migrating to what we're calling legacy applications, what Yaroslav was calling those telco NFV, long running, need to be need to stay up for a long time type applications. The state, the condition of uh, the, the particular user's code is stored in that little blue database icon inside. If this application, this M1, happens to go down, if the virtual machine hosting that dies, then what happens is all the state goes away and all of your users will lose all of their cell phone connections. That's a pretty bad thing. That's why people are migrating to these mode two or cloud native type applications. Each M2 that you see is an individual user's code. So you run each user in their own process. All of the state sits outside of that. So if any user's code actually crashes, what happens is you just start up a new M2, you reassociate that user's cell phone call with it, they pick up their state from that blue database icon, and they just they may not even know that something happened. There may be a momentary glitch in their call, there may not even be a glitch at all. This is one of the reasons why many people are beginning to migrate to mode two or cloud native type applications. Yaroslav introduced a term, 12-factor. <clears throat> I want to cover this real quickly and go into why we're terming these 12-factor rather than cloud-native, stateless, mode 1, mode 2, etc. I'm going to pick out three or four items in this particular slide, and we'll discuss them real shortly. Number one, let, let's look at number six, processes. If you're a 12-factor application, you're going to execute your application as one or more stateless processes. That's one of the reasons why people say, hey, stateless equals cloud native. But as you see with these 12 factors, there's actually a lot of other factors that go into making a true cloud native application. Port binding, Kubernetes provides this to you automatically. Services within Kubernetes are exposed via a TCP network port. In addition, you'll end up seeing storing config in the environment, number three. Uh, you'll, you'll see that as a classic mechanism of deploying Kubernetes services. And then finally, the most important, number eight, concurrency, scale out via the process model. 
that's exactly what you saw in the prior slide where you're actually scaling out one user per one process per user if you think about that m1 process that you saw there was one it could consume up to an entire physical machine but it could go no further with m2s i can scatter them out all across multiple types of nodes and therefore i can scale as as far as my kubernetes control plane will handle which is a long ways Real quickly, um, I'm not going to drill into this slide a whole lot, but I wanted to make sure that as you take these slides away with you, that you actually have a set of terms that you'll hear thrown around in the industry a lot. You've already seen this used mode one, mode two. This was a classic set of terms that were used a lot in the OpenStack world where both Yar Yaroslav and I spent quite a bit of time. So we wanted to make sure that we had something for OpenStack users that, that was homey and familiar to them in terms of, oh yeah, I recognize those terms. You also saw us, by the way, use cattle. That's another term, pets and cattle, that started coming out of that, that OpenStack world. Cloud Native actually started in OpenStack and now has been somewhat absconded, might be a, a fairly strong term, but it's been preemptively adopted by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which it was a pretty smart move on their part. In addition, you'll hear people talk about stateful and stateless. You've heard us use 12 factor. This actually came out of a company called Heroku, which um, introduced some really good concepts, has not made nearly as much market penetration as Kubernetes has, but we like the term. We think it's very effective and we're starting to see that really get traction inside the Kubernetes world as well. So therefore, I would encourage you, if you're gonna be discussing how you're migrating your code, discuss 12 factor and then fold these other terms inside it as effectively subsets of a 12 factor application. All right, let's move on towards targeting the market segments. That's one of the things we promised you that after Yaroslav ran through those market segments and really helped you understand here's the different types of user populations or demographics that use this tool. Let's talk about how SUS is going to address these. So real quickly, Yaroslav emphasized that the market share percentage of OpenStack IaaS users was small. It's arguably in the single digit percentages. So that particular segment of the market is, is small and it's really not growing. This is one of the reasons why SUSE, in aligning with the technology trends and the customer base is saying it doesn't make much sense to do, uh, do serious investment there. So we're helping our customers transition to what we believe is a solid trend going forward. And these are the segments that Yaroslav talked about. Virtualization users, container curious, and container focused. You see a combination of platforms there that we can use to address those particular segments. So while this text is, is very clear, I think a picture says a thousand words. So our goal is to be able to provide two different models. One, phased transitions at your pace, or two, hey, if you've got things picked out, just plant yourself in that one spot. If you look down at the bottom, SUSE CAS platform with Kubevert uh, technology we'll be discussing momentarily, that that's, will be included in the SUSE CAS platform going forward, that one-stop shop will fit all three of these user market segments. And once again, you can start in one spot and transition, or you can simply stay there, and that, and that product will support your use case going forward. Finally, let's go ahead and drill into next-gen SDI in depth. So, as we've discussed, as Yaroslav emphasized, SUSE started out with Kubernetes a number of years ago. We've based uh, the, the two major products in our container and application platforms market, we've, we've based those on Kubernetes. Uh, that was a prediction on SUSE's part. We're very happy to see Kubernetes success. We've been contributing to that and will continue to contribute upstream. Kubernetes has an industry mind and market share. It's a solid and growing API, and we have those established products. So it really makes sense both from a market perspective and from a SUSE perspective to help base our customers on that successful technology. Next, as we've emphasized, SUSE has an upstream and community focus. I'm emphasizing this point here because SUSE is going to, uh, we're going to work as we have very strongly on having a solid upstream presence contributing to those technologies and ensuring that all of the benefits of open source, things like multiple eyes on the code, a lot of ideas coming from a lot of different places, it's kind of an idea cooker. So there's a lot of really good things about open source. That third point I wanna emphasize, there's two points or two places that open source code will tend to start. One is a bunch of people may come together and say, we have this need. This is kind of a consortium or an industry. Everyone come together and, and figure out how we're gonna solve a problem. 
That's one mechanism. A second mechanism is let's take a look at how Linux started. This actually started in Linux, Linux's basement years and years ago, 26 years ago. So he then turned around and contributed that upstream. The goal long term is to minimize any one particular company's or person's ownership of code. That's exactly what Linus did with his code. That's exactly what we'll be doing here. So while there will be small pieces of SUSE specific code, that code will be contributed upstream and will ensure that everyone has access to that and hopefully that takes root as well. Second, container and VM or next, container and VM orchestration. We, we strongly feel, due to the market analysis that Yaroslav has walked through with you, that it's critical for us to manage both containers and virtual machines as equal citizens from that Kubernetes control plane, and we're targeting Kubert for that. There's a lot of industry alignment in this right now, so we feel this is an excellent choice as well. Next, identity management. This is the ability to tie where your usernames and passwords come from into an enterprise architecture. Kubernetes in and of itself tends to carry its own authorization. The problem in an enterprise environment, and SUSE has very strong roots in the enterprise marketplace, uh, we, we effectively own the SAP HANA market uh, for Linux, and that is, that is absolutely an enterprise market. Uh, those enterprise users will bring their own identity providers with them, LDAP, SAML, and others. So we're making sure that we tie our Kubernetes in with those identity managers so you have a single sign-on, one place for all of your credentials to come from. Next, flexible deployments. We're going to have an installation based on cluster API, and then cluster API is much like a, a protocol stack. So you've got a top layer shim and then multiple device drivers underneath it. These device drivers in the cluster API world are called providers. And for each different physical environment you install on, whether it's on-premise bare metal or on-premise IaaS like OpenStack or on-premise VMware or public cloud or managed Kubernetes offerings, each one of those is a separate provider and you can use the same installation mechanism, cluster API, to lay the system down in these different locations. This is to drive towards giving our customers flexibility in how they want to deploy. You saw this once again mentioned earlier in terms of a market need and what Yaroslav talked about. Real quick picture, this is from the Kubevert uh, documentation. Uh, you'll notice I'm going to point out a couple things. Number one, the virtual machine is running inside a pod. That's that middle pod on the rightmost block. That particular pod is nothing more than a Linux namespace, just like any other Kubernetes pod. The VM is actually a user space process. This is KVM, and KVM runs as a combination of a user space process and a matching kernel. So there is no additional overhead here. It's a very effective mechanism of putting a virtual machine inside the Kubernetes pod and container architecture. So once again, we feel very positively about Kubevert. Cluster API, a real quick picture on this one. Just to show you uh, the, the simple installation mechanism uh, that you'll see a bootstrap machine. This is a standard, almost every architecture that I've seen to, to bootstrap a larger architecture tends to have a bootstrap machine. So cluster API follows that model. Uh, the one thing I would change on this picture, it's pulled from their documentation, is I would stick those infrastructure providers underneath that bootstrap machine to really drive that proto stack, protocol stack model that I described earlier. All right, finally. Here's, here's what we consider an extremely important piece. Every single RFI that SUSE has received from prospects as well as requests from customers tends to include something about multi-tenancy. We would like to, the, the statement is, we would like to share our hardware um, in order to maximize ROI on that hardware across multiple departments, but we need to make sure that we isolate some of these users or tenants from each other on that cluster. Maybe for regulatory reasons, maybe for company restrictions, uh, but regardless, the CIO is handed a piece, a set of hardware or a budget for a set of hardware and needs to maximize ROI there. We've taken a look at what Kubernetes provides by default. We feel it's a very good place to start. The, the RBAC, those, those five items that you see listed in that first bullet point, are things that Kubernetes provides. However, that's not enough in our opinion. So you see projects like Open Policy Agent spooling up inside CNCF. And SUSE has started designing a set of objects that will actually provide a configurable level of isolation that goes above and beyond what Kubernetes by default will provide. Once again, this will be pushed upstream. We feel pretty strongly that this is an excellent addition to Kubernetes, and we want to make sure we share that with the world. Finally, uh, Open Policy Agent is an excellent project, but there's some complexity there. 
and throwing some of the difficult configurations at users uh, is not a is not a SUSE core value. So one of the value adds we'll be doing there is a simpler default set of isolation policies in addition to an easy to use policy editor or manager. There's a whole lot more that we could discuss, but we've run out of time. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Once again, our emails are at the top of the slide. One more point, uh, the references for the statistics that Yaroslav referenced are, uh, are here, and then you can reach out to us for anything. Thank you for your time today. Hope you all have enjoyed the session.